So I may look like a normal high-energy particle physicist. In fact, I'm a time-traveling detective. I'm trying to understand some of the deepest mysteries of the universe, trying to understand what it's made of. How did it become like this? What's going to happen to it a billion years from now? In fact, why are we here? In fact, from my investigations, it seems that we shouldn't actually exist at all. None of us, planet Earth, none of the stars, none of the galaxies, it shouldn't be here. But something happened 14 billion years ago that allowed the universe to come into existence. And I want to share with you some of the evidence we have to show what actually happened back then. In fact, my daily commute is not very far. I travel from one country, my home in France, on the Jura Mountains. I cross the border every day into Switzerland, and I go to work to my office uh, at CERN, the European Centre for Particle Physics, near Geneva. And it's an office like most of you, or m most of your adults actually have. It's got a computer in it, it's got piles of paper, it's a bit of a mess. It's like most people's offices. But from there, I can go somewhere quite different from most people. I can go 100 metres underground. And I use the largest scientific machine ever made. In fact, the largest machine ever made. This is just a tiny part of it. So this tiny part, you can just about see a person in the middle there. So this object is 15 metres high, it's 20 metres long, 14,000 tonnes. And it, so it's about the same size as this room. And it took around 3,000 scientists and engineers more than 20 years to design, build it, and get it running. So in fact, I've been working on this one piece of equipment for the past 20 years, which is kind of scary because that's before lots of you in the audience were actually born. So I've been working on the same thing. So I use this to explore the universe, to understand the universe. And the first thing I want to understand is what is it made of? So to give you an example, what I mean by that is here I have two Lego balls, tenuous balls. Um, and I want to know what these are made of. So perhaps the easiest way to know what they're made of is to smash them together. <coughs> Which is maybe a surprise to you that I'd do that. So what we actually found together is that it's made of smaller things. No, no real surprise there. But then what I do is I then take the smaller things and I smash those together. And I keep doing this until I get to the smallest things I can possibly find. And it turns out that once we do that enough, once we have high enough speed with the smallest particles, we find the most basic building blocks. And in fact, there are only three of them, called the up and down quark and the electron. With these basic bricks, I can build anything. I can build any atom, any molecule, any known substance on Earth. So as an example, if I take two of these up quarks and one of the down quarks, put them together, I make a thing called a proton that many of you may have heard of. If I then add an electron to that, I get this. It's an atom of hydrogen, simplest element. So you can imagine now that I just build more and more bricks together. I build different atoms, different molecules. It's a bit harder to put things back together again, so I'll let someone else put these things back together again in the break. But what's most fascinating is it's not just every substance on Earth is made of these three basic building blocks. In fact, everything in the universe, every star, every galaxy, every planet, every alien who's maybe asking similar questions to us, is made of the same things, which is kind of fascinating. Because that means I can explore the whole universe from my lab 100 metres underground without having to put a spacesuit on. 
which is quite useful. Now, of course, being a scientist, you want to go a bit further. So, of course, the, we ask our qu the question, OK, so what if we take these smallest things and we smash those together? Do we get even smaller things? Well, this is science. So this is making a theory and then trying to test it and see whether our theory is correct. So we're going to do that today as well. But for this, I need some help from the audience. So I'd like to invite Dominic back to the stage. So a round of applause for Dominic before he starts. <laughs> so this is where it gets a little bit dangerous. So we have to put on our protective equipment. Apologies to those of you in the front row who I don't have enough protective equipment to go around. So it's very vital to have the glasses as well. So maybe this is your impression of a real physicist now. So now I'm going to let Dominic show you what happens if we can now collide the smallest things at even higher speeds. Do we get smaller things? Wow. Now, <laughs> thank you. So that's not quite what we imagined would happen. So before explaining what actually did happen, I'd like to thank Dominic once again for his alchemy skills. <laughs> Thanks, Dominic. I hope none of you got hurt in that experiment. So what we found, what Dominic found, was we didn't make smaller things, we made something bigger than what we started with. Now, although a couple of hundred years ago, we may have been burnt as witches for doing such a thing, for transforming one thing into another, we actually have someone different to thank for the explanation. So in fact, it's Einstein's birthday today. So he'd be 136, so just a couple of years older than me. And his most famous equation, that I'm sure all of you have heard of, E equals mc squared, gives us the reason that this could happen. So if we start with some mass, the two balls, m in this equation, we can convert that to energy, the E in the equation. And once we've made that energy, that energy can then transform itself into a different m, something bigger than what we started with, something different. So in our collisions, what we've found is a different set of bricks. In fact, a few different sets of bricks. One of those sets of bricks looks very like the things that I talked about earlier, the up and down quarks and the electron. But they have a different electric charge. They're called antimatter versions. We also found rather different particles, particles that don't exist in our universe anymore naturally although we can make them in the lab. But they did exist at the time of the Big Bang, 14 billion years ago. So again, just by smashing things together, we can actually travel through time and see what the universe was like in its very early days. Now, my time machine isn't actually a DeLorean driven by Einstein <laughs> at precise speed. It's something much larger uh, much faster, and it actually exists. So this is the Large Hadron Collider near Geneva. In fact, you can see Geneva Airport at the bottom of the screen there. So the Large Hadron Collider is a 27-kilometer ring that accelerates and collides protons together at nearly the speed of light. And then we need something to take photos of what happens in those collisions, to see what happened. And that's the job of this part here that I talked about uh, very briefly earlier, which is called the CMS experiment. So it's like a big digital camera, a rather big digital camera. Now, nature hasn't been very kind to us. It, she's hidden the sort of best evidence about what happened in the early days of the universe very well. So only about once in every 100 billion collisions do we actually find something that gives us a, a clue, a hint, to what the universe was actually like in the very early days? So we have to make lots and lots of collisions, and we have to have a very powerful camera to actually take a look at it. So this 3D 
digital camera, if you like, is only 100 megapixels equivalent, which doesn't sound like very much when you compare it to the phones that you've all got in your pockets, or some of you have got out. But it can take 40 million photographs every second. And we operate normally for 200 days a year, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we take a lot of photographs. More even than on Facebook. <laughs> so this is our typical, well, this is an atypical photograph of one of these collisions. And you see all the, the, the signs of things flying apart with a couple of interesting things that I won't point out now. So after looking through several trillion images like this, which is what we get students for, <laughs> we found some rather interesting things, some rather amazing things. In fact, the what we seem to think is that the universe shouldn't have come into existence like it is now at all. So to give you an example, remember I talked about antimatter very briefly. So we believe at the time of the Big Bang, there were equal amounts of matter and antimatter created. And matter and antimatter have a nasty habit of killing each other as soon as they meet. So all the matter and antimatter should have destroyed each other a billionth of a second after the Big Bang. So that means there'd be nothing left. Now fortunately, some of the matter must have survived this massacre, because otherwise I wouldn't be here giving this talk. And you wouldn't be here hopefully listening. But we don't understand why. And we don't understand why there's no antimatter left. If there's some matter, surely there should be some antimatter somewhere, but we can't find any of it. So we're hoping to get some answers to this with the Large Hadron Collider and with CMS. So we're studying the infinitely small, but we also work a lot with other detectives, if you like, who study the infinitely large, called cosmologists. So by, and by combining our evidence together, we get another very strange picture of the universe. So by looking at the way galaxies move, we can tell that there's something more to this galaxy than just the stars and the planets that we can see. Something much more. There's about five times more mass, more matter there than we can see, but, we can't, but it's invisible. So we come up with a, an amazingly imaginative name. We call it dark matter. And there's a lot of it. And it's not just out there. It's everywhere. It's here right now. It's going through you without you feeling it. We don't know what it is. So of course what we want to do in our collisions is we want to make dark matter particles and study them and figure out what the explanation is for this in our mini Big Bangs. There's also dark energy. So dark energy is like a, a mystical dark force that is playing a big role in how the universe is actually evolving. The galaxies are actually moving apart from each other as we speak at ever-increasing speeds, as if something's pushing them apart, but we don't have any idea what that is. So hopefully we might get some insight into that with the Large Hadron Collider, but at the moment we're completely stuck for ideas, so maybe you guys in the audience can help us there. There's also a question of mass. Why do some particles weigh more than others? Now that set may sound like a, a pretty pointless question, right? but in fact it has some fundamental reasons why it's interesting. If the up quark and the electron, for example, here, didn't have the masses that they actually have, the universe might look very, very different. might look like this. No planets, no stars, no galaxies, just light. And that's it. So we've been studying mass, thinking about it for decades now. What is mass? Where does it come from? And we believe that there's an invisible force field throughout the whole universe. And some particles, when they travel through the force field, get more 
mass than other particles traveling through this field. Now, of course, you ask yourself, so how can you possibly detect something that's completely invisible? And again, it comes back to smashing things together. So some of that E, that energy, in some of our collisions, maybe what we can do is we can disrupt this force field. Maybe we can make it reveal itself. So it's a bit like me putting some energy with this coin into this glass. Okay. So what some of you near the front saw was that actually what's inside the glass, which looks invisible normally, which is the water, revealed itself with a splash because I put energy into it. And after looking through trillions of photographs, what we found were a few splashes, a bit like this. And we called them Higgs bosons, which you may have heard about. And it wasn't only us that got excited by this discovery that this the first evidence that this force field does actually exist. But people all around the world got excited as well. We had an estimated audience of a billion people. And the Nobel Prize Committee also sat up and looked at this. And in 2013, the uh, prize in physics was awarded to two of the physicist detectives who came up with the theory in the first place nearly 50 years ago. So now we need more collisions to find out more and we need your help as well. We need people to look at things from different perspectives. We know hardly anything about the universe as I've shown you. Not even about the Higgs boson. We've only made a few. We need to study it from different angles, understand it more from every perspective. Now why is that important? Well, let's give you an example. So here's a a physicist who thinks he's discovered something, thinks he's discovered a rope. He doesn't have the full picture of everything. So there's another physicist who also thinks he's found something. He thinks he's found a spear, something sharp and pointy. It's quite different from the rope. And then there's another physicist, and she thinks she's found a wall, just a brick wall. And it's only when you combine the evidence, the experience, the perspectives from everyone you actually figure out what you found, which is not any of those three things. It's something quite different. So we're not yet sure, completely sure, that what we found is what we think we found. So there's still a long way to go. Now, in fact, the Large Hadron Collider will switch on again in a couple of weeks from now and start colliding particles in a couple of months from now. And it will continue for at least the next 20 years. So this is where you guys can come and work with us. And during that time, we know we will get some more answers. We know we'll get an insight into antimatter, into dark matter, more about mass, perhaps something about dark energy. And what's most interesting to most physicists like me is, what else? What, there might be things that we've just not thought of at all that help us explain the universe why it's like it is now. So this is where you come in because your perspectives might help us achieve that and find this other things. And in fact, you can already start. So lots of our data are now available together with tools to actually look at these things. So from the comfort of your own home or from your own school, you can start looking, our data, looking at our data too. And who's no, who knows what you might find when you just smash things together. Thank you.